Ooh. What a well-organized thing. Welcome and thank you. Oh, I need to put on some, I need to do something here. If I want to walk around, right? It works? Yes, it does. <laughs> and it's getting late in the day and we're going to have to stay awake and alert. And I think we, let's try to make this a little bit interactive because otherwise you may fall asleep and, uh, and I will probably forget some uh, things. Um, let me start a, with a little preface about UNDP and about the UNDP Seoul uh, Policy Center. This is, uh, these are the areas of work of UNDP's new uh, strategic plan. Uh, and uh, this is not our first strategic plan because we date back to 1966. Uh, we are the implementing arm of the UN uh, system and we work in some 177 countries and territories and besides having a mandate to do this work that you see up there, uh, we also have the mandate to coordinate the UN system through what is called the resident coordinator system. You may have heard of that. In every country, developing country, there is a resident coordinator because there are many UN agencies and many countries many that we work in want us to work better together, which of course makes very, very good sense with scarce resources and many, many issues and a compli uh, complicated agenda. It's important that we don't duplicate, that we make the best of the resources. Uh, now, we have a budget of uh, some five billion US dollars every year and we are entirely voluntarily funded. And less of fifth, than 15% of our budget is uh, core, which means on earmark. The rest is earmarked in one way or the other to do specific uh, activities. In 2013, the Republic of Korea was the 11th largest uh, donor to UNDP, providing almost 79 uh, million US dollars. And uh, we thank you very much for that. Uh, Korea is a, a, a growing, what do you call it, a growing donor to uh, UNDP. Now, the um, Seoul Policy Center is, uh, and we are on the fourth floor just uh, above here. Um, we are one of six global policy centers that UNDP hosts uh, around the world in uh, different countries. We work on different issues, but together I think we sort of cover the ground of UNDP's mandate. The UNDP Seoul Policy Center was established in 2011 to work with Korea and international issues and share experience with other countries. Uh, we are hosted by Korea University and our, we, we uh, succeeded a country office. Uh, maybe you know that UNDP was very much part of U, uh, Korea's own development uh, journey uh, starting from the early 60s, even before we came UNDP. In 2009, when Korea graduated, became a donor, member of OECD DAC, uh, and we were closing down because we no longer had a role in Korea, the government said that they wanted to us to stay on but in a different role which is what we are doing now and our three pillar work program uh, has uh, a focus on the global partnership on development effectiveness maybe you recall that uh, in Busan in 2011 there was a big international meeting hosted uh, the follow-up to that we we work on parts of that agenda along with the post 2015 development agenda some issues and I'm going to focus in on that agenda today uh, the second pillar is development solutions partnerships where we work on specific uh, thematic issues with Korean counterparts and through UNDP's network with uh, other countries. Some of the issues we are working on is uh, Samul Ondong, the new village movement. Uh, we are going to look into some work on anti-corruption, um, some green technology and other issues. And the third pillar is outreach like what I'm doing here today. Uh, we are here, of course, also to talk a lot to people. To We represent UNDP more broadly than the agenda of, of uh, the center. And, uh, of course, it's important that we interact with, uh, with many people like you. Now, the first part of my presentation is going to be on a safe and just space for humanity. 
Now this is a little bit on the understanding of what the challenges are that we are facing and that the discussions on the post-2015 development agenda, the new agenda, uh, is, sent, is circling around, trying to uh, grasp hold of. Um, now, you have heard, of course, of the Millennium Development Goals. Anyone who hasn't, please raise their hands. No? Oh, you haven't? The Millennium Development Goals came out of the Millennium Declaration in 2000. Uh, the goals were actually put together by the UN system following the declaration because uh, we wanted to have uh, something more concrete uh, and not just a, a declaration. So these eight goals were put out there and they have a deadline in 2015 uh, uh, as, um, as stated up there. Now, progress has been made Definitely. Uh, we are close to meeting the goals on education, uh, health uh, has improved. There are many improvements in these, uh, in these goals, but we still have a long, long way uh, to go. For instance, and let, now I have to read because this is, uh, uh, these numbers have to be correct. 1.2 billion people still live in extreme poverty. Extreme poverty is less than a dollar and a quarter a day. One billion people worldwide still practice open defecation. You know what that is? Yes, not very nice. And almost 2.5 billion do not have access to improved sanitation. This is of course a major health risk and it also has implications for the environment. I may touch on that later. 870 million people are going to bed every night hungry and 1.3 billion people do not have access to electricity. So while we've been going through uh, 15 years, almost 15 years of uh, growth in many parts of the world, this growth has not trickled down uh, like it is often assumed and we still have the bottom billions, those who basically have not benefited uh, much from, uh, from developments. Have you heard of the, uh, the Rio summit in 2012? Yeah. Uh, in the run-up to that conference, um, to, to prepare and to find out what the issues uh, should be, uh, the UN system did a survey among governments and asked them to spell out which were the important issues to deal with. And they pointed at uh, 11 critical social uh, dimensions, food, water, income, education, resilience, voice, jobs, energy, social equity, and gender equality and health. And those are the ones you see in the inner circle there, right? Now these, many of you will uh, recall that you've seen many of these in the context of the MDGs, but there are also additional uh, issues. And uh, the blue field you see in the circle uh, is the gap in meeting these needs and fulfilling human rights. So you see the gaps are quite considerable in some cases. And then of course the white space is where we don't have uh, sufficient data to, um, to measure. Now the outer circle, you see there's an outer circle and that is about the planetary boundaries. You know that we are seven billion on planet Earth now and we only have one Earth, even though we talk about Mars and the Moon and other uh, things. We, we have one planet and of course uh, not endless uh, resources. The Stockholm Environment Institute has identified nine planetary boundaries. Has anyone heard about these before? No? No one has heard about this? Are you all studying social sciences, political science, or someone not in that field of a... Uh, okay. Uh, so let's just dwell a little bit on these two so that you get an idea of what this is. Um, you will notice that uh, two of them are, are red, right? That's because we have already exceeded our planetary um, limits. One is biodiversity loss. And the other one is the nitrogen cycle. Does anyone know what that is? The yes. The nitrogen cycle 
and I was speaking about open defecation before, right? The nitrogen cycle is, and this is not very nice, but this is a fact of life. The nitrogen cycle is about urine. It's about husbandry, animals, and their urine from agriculture that sifts through uh, soil and water and into the oceans. Uh, and uh, it's also about human urine that is not cleaned this, when the sewage is not cleaned. And we know that cleaning of sewage for this is, is rather recent. In my country, for instance, which is Denmark, which is considered fairly developed, we only started cleaning for um, nitrogen in 1987. So you can imagine that there's a huge issue around the world. What happens when this nitrogen uh, hits the water is that it, there's, it, it um, adds too many nutrients. So algae and other things that we don't want grow. And in the end, it suffocates the, nat the natural environment. Right, so it's really a, a bad. Um, biodiversity loss, we, we are losing biodiversity at a rate that uh, we, we cannot, um, we, can, we can hardly count it. Now all the other issues, uh, some with climate change, you see we're getting there. Some of them, some of the issues up there are not quantified. Uh, so we don't have exact uh, numbers, but there are important issues that can, uh, hinder development uh, in other areas if they are not uh, dealt with. Now, if you want to, I can talk more about this, but you can, may come back with some questions. So uh, let's just move to the next slide. This combines the, the two circles, and you'll see the donut. This one is called the donut. Uh, and the green space is the safe and just space for humanity. That's where we can deal without uh, bringing future generations into jeopardy uh, or breaking down the, the foundation of uh, our societies. Uh, this is developed by Kate Rayworth. I want to credit an economist from Oxfam. Have you ever heard of Oxfam? It, yes, uh, she has developed this. There's some very nice blogs and you can search on the web and find more, uh, find more about this. Now, if we put the two together, the planetary boundaries and the uh, human rights, you will see that we are overshooting the planetary boundaries and we are undershooting human rights, right? That's not a very uh, good a cocktail to, to start from. However, if we look at some of the issues, it's not really a big deal if there is a will to deal with it. We could end hunger for all by 3% of global food, food supply. Uh, we can uh, supply everyone with electricity by emitting by 1% of the global CO2 emissions. So there are some issues of priority and also of distribution, right? And I'll talk about uh, inequality in a while, but it's clearly related uh, to that. Uh, if we look on who puts pressure on the planet, uh, it's the rich or the richer in every part of the world. It used to be in the rich part of the world only now. We have a much more diverse world. So it's uh, those who have who put the pressure, like the 50% of global CO2 emissions are produced by 11% of the world's population. And I was speaking about nitrogen before. You will see that 33% of the global nitrogen budget is used to be, produce meat for the EU. So um, we have a clear picture here of, uh, of, um, of inequality and uh, distribution. Now on, on inequality, uh, we know it's on the stark rise. This is documented. Maybe you have uh, also followed in the media. More and more people speak about this, uh, even the IMF. Uh, they put out a report um, earlier this year, UNDP put out a report about inequality in January this year. Uh, Oxfam put out that um, study where they found that the richest 85% of uh, people in the world own the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the world's population. Um, the Gini coefficients, you know what that is? You know what that is, okay. <laughs> um, and just to go closer to in the region here, uh, the majority of Asia's population is living in more unequal societies today than they had two de decades ago. 
So it, this growing inequality is, is everywhere. Now, of course, when you talk about why it is happening, there may be some disagreement, but here, is, here are some offerings, some of the underlying causes at least. Uh, these ones, we've had a globalization process ongoing, which has weakened those who cannot move around so fast, which is typically labor. You know, you can move, move production to, ch to cheaper places where there's less taxation or less um, uh, ch cheaper labor, less environmental standards. Uh, you also have governments who are weakened uh, compared to the global corporations who again can move uh, to other places if they don't find uh, the conditions satisfactory. And one very, um, one element of this which is really coming to the forefront now, uh, I think it's something that has been known for many years. I remember when I studied at Copenhagen University, I had a book called Danish Investments in Developing Countries and it was all about uh, mispricing, how companies mispriced, they could, uh, when they traded internally, they could set the prices so that they would take out the profit into a, somewhere where the taxation is lower or where, the, where there's no taxation. So this is known, but of course with trade growing uh, from 25% of world output in 1960 to now more than 60%, more and more of the world's economy are being put at risk of this malpractice, this potential malpractice. Uh, there's a recent there are many studies of this, but a, a, a very recent study uh, of this looking at five African countries, um, Uganda, Ghana, Mozambique, Kenya and Tanzania, and this is just to illustrate, showed that from 2002 to 2011, they lost, through this mispricing, they lost uh, between 7 and almost 13 percent of their revenue. And for countries that have, uh, are wealthier, this is, may not be so important. In, in my country it's also a, a problem that these companies don't pay tax, they move the whatever around. It's less of a problem because there are more taxpayers, it's more solid economy and so on. But in a poor country, if you lose 13% of your potential revenue every year on that account, it really makes a huge uh, difference. And this is one of, the, um, one of the issues that is being discussed now as part of what is called illicit funding, that for the new development agenda, we need to look at, the, at how these um, how we can improve the tax systems, improve international uh, cooperation to counter these uh, developments. Now, a second uh, issue is the domestic policies. Um, UNDP's report from January clearly says that the domestically uh, governments have been very um, aiming at con consolidating instead of introducing progressive taxation uh, and also looking at social expenditure. I think that may be changing slightly. Many countries are now looking to um, social, social protection uh, because they also see that it really benefits and it brings, uh, it brings uh, a lot of strength to the, to the population to have these, uh, these uh, nets. It's more than a net, but it's a guarantee of certain, uh, certain uh, income at certain times. Uh, in lives. Now, of course, to deal with this requires governance, global governance, national governance, and I just want you to show you this little petri dish. You know what this is? Have you ever been to a lab? Yeah? They grow your bact bacteria, right? If you have a sore throat, they may be grown in a petri dish. And what happens if there's bacteria and nothing to fight it? the bacteria will grow all over. I show you this because if you remember anything, you remember pictures and you'll remember the Petri dish, right? This is another way of understanding governance because if we don't do anything, the bacteria will, will go all over. And governance in the life of the world is a way of making sure that the bacteria stays controlled or at least doesn't spread all over. We know what happens when governance breaks down the ultimate 
the ultimate result when uh, outcome when gov governance breaks down, when our rules and institutions no longer functions, that is war. Right? We have seen that before. I think at this continent you have um, you have seen a, a particular um, side of, of this. But uh, we go back to 1945, and of course we, the world was in a, a very uh, different state coming out of World War II. Second part, the post-2015 development agenda. This is the, the new agenda coming after the MDGs. Of course, the MDGs will have to be part of that new agenda because, as we saw, they have not been achieved. Uh, so there is an un, a lot of unfinished uh, business. So there's no doubt that the um, MDGs will uh, be uh, very strong in, in that agenda. Um, since we, we've known that this deadline is coming up, and since we also had the Rio process that we just uh, referenced, um, these processes have come together in a broader kind of thinking than earlier. Uh, I was speaking about the safe and just space for humanity. That is a way of approaching, a more integrated way of development, where the Millennium Development Goals were more social only. There was not so much economic, they were not so much environmental. Actually, the, there is an environmental goal, but it's very weak um, and, and not uh, very clear. Now, a lot, a lot of thoughts have been um, thought to prepare for this new agenda. Which, where should we go? What should the focus be? And I'm just listing some of the reports that have been prepared. The first one is done by the UN um, system. That is all the UN organizations together to sort of put uh, some ideas, proposals uh, on the table of governments to get their thinking going. Of course, the idea is not that the UN system does this thinking and we were told at a certain time to step back because government said we can't follow. It's our time that we are in the driver's seat, which they are now. Uh, of course, the Rio outcome document uh, from 2012 was a, an important part of this. The Secretary General had a high-level panel of eminent persons who looked into sustainable uh, future. The Global Compact, do you know what that is? The, working with the, the UN working with the private sector. You know, the UN has all these standards, we have all these conventions that governments have agreed. Uh, we have all these agreements on on goals, conventions, and so on, a wide, wide range of things. And in 2000, and uh, I think, no, 1999, Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General, said, we will now put that, offer that medicine to the private sector. So he put together a little package of nine, now it's 10, uh, areas that's derived from the environmental and social and human rights agenda, anti-corruption, and, um, Private companies have then, since then, been able to sign up to these and say they will adhere to these principles and they report on it and so on. There's a chapter of um, the uh, Global Compact in Korea that has, I think, some 500 uh, Korean um, companies as member. They also did a report. Uh, Sus Sustainable Development Solutions Network is an academic network that's uh, led out of Columbia University. They put out a lot of interesting reports. The Secretary General put out a report in um, September last year, and then there are numerous uh, NGO papers. Now, the SG's report from September last year sort of summarized everything that was in the other uh, reports in a way by saying this agenda has to have five headlines. One is eradication of all forms of poverty. You know, poverty is more than income. It's also a question of access to many resources and health and so on. Uh, the second is tackling exclusion and inequality. The third is promoting inclusive and sustainable growth. The fourth is building peace and effective governance. The fifth is addressing climate change and other environmental challenges. Now this is actually not so different than what was in the Millennium Declaration. The difference this time will hopefully be that these issues come together in a better way and are seen as interlinked uh, and it will be dealt with in a way that's, um, that's uh, interlinked. In September last year, 
there was uh, a special event where governments discussed and say, said, what, what, what do we do next, right? We've come this far, how do we proceed? How do we get to 2015 where we can agree, hopefully, on a new development agenda? And they agreed that they wanted a single post-2015 framework, meaning that it's not the environmental issues over here and the social economic over here. It's one single framework. We merge the Rio and the Millennium Declaration. Um, then there was agreement on, on the overall issues. And the fourth uh, point there is agreement was agreement on that these would be goals for all countries with national variations. You know the Millennium Development Goals? Are they for everyone? When I ask like that, they probably aren't. <laughs> the the, there's goal seven, half of goal seven and goal eight, which is on partnership and financing, that's also for rich countries. The others are for developing countries, right? It's like for you over there, and then we will help you. The idea of this new agenda is that these goals will be for all. They may not take the same shape in, in every country because you, it, it, there is a variation. There's a variation of uh, responsibilities and so on. But the idea is to have one agenda for all countries. And of course, that's also a huge uh, challenge. In the UN system, um, in 2011 already, UNDP started thinking about doing some consultations, not with governments, but with citizens all over the world, hoping to get citizens involved and engaged for them to discuss with their governments, of course, to engage in this whole um, discussion about the future uh, we want. And there's a global web, uh, web platform uh, survey that you can access and, and answer. Uh, the five regional consultations were, were held on, um, on this new agenda. 11 initial thematic consultations on inequality, on environmental sustainability, on gender, on many issues. And six more have just been launched uh, this uh, spring. And two of them uh, are actually going to be financed by, um, by Korea. Korea was also a contributor to making uh, the other consultations possible. Uh, the six new consultations focus on the implementation, what it will take, accountability, uh, civil society, uh, role of private sector, and so on. And then uh, there were 88 national consultations where the UN system, UNDP, and uh, the Department for Economic and Social Affairs uh, worked with the government and stakeholders in countries to go through uh, consultations on how uh, this new agenda should be shaped, what the issues were. And there's a, um, a website um, where you can find more information about all this. Now, in um, spring last year, an open working group was established under the General Assembly. This, is, um, has a, this one comes out of the Rio process. It was mandated, decided in Rio. Uh, it, the mandate is to prepare the sustainable development goals that will take over from the MDGs. Uh, it is, in theory, a working group with 30 members. That's what the Rio outcome document said. The interest was so huge that 70 countries, uh, 30 represents 70 countries, so some are together in groups. But in fact, I think all 193 participate. So, it's a little bit unclear, but they have had 11 meetings now. Uh, and their report is due in September this year before the final negotiations on the post-2015 agenda starts. Now, these are the focus areas that uh, have been discussed over these 11 meetings. And uh, the, I think it started out as 19. After they had uh, all the discussions, then the co-chairs identified 19. It was reduced to 16. And then when they had the last meeting, one more came. 
And of course, this is probably too many. Most uh, would say we need 10 or 12 goals. So how do you, dis how do you make a selection? How do you actually uh, cut this back to, to um, a reasonable number? But these focus areas are potentially the new uh, goals. Of course, they have to be phrased and worded to become goals, but these are the, these are the areas. Um, now, the difficult issues here is, I already mentioned how many goals, right? 10, 12 is probably uh, the maximum. We had eight MDGs, so a few more will be okay, but it will not be manageable to have more. The question of how many goals is related to a narrative, the text of a report. Instead of saying these are the goals, you can put things into the text. Now, how does that make a difference? It makes a difference because if you put something into a goal, it'll be more visible, it'll get more attention. Everyone will focus in, in the next 15 years, there'll be a review of this and follow up, data collection. If you put it into the narrative, it will not get the same um, dis uh, attention. So one way of getting issues out of attention is of course to put them in the narrative. So if governments don't want to have too much attention on some things, they put it in the narrative. And some of the issues that uh, some countries, many developing countries, want to put the rule of law into the narrative because they do not want the world, the global community, to overlook their work. This relates, of course, also to human rights and, and uh, other issues. Um, there's an issue relating to climate change because climate change will have, maybe you know that, uh, next year there will be a conference in Paris, a COP conference of the parties, where they have agreed to reach a new agreement on climate change. Now, how do you deal with that when you have a, one process of governments in one place and you have the, the goals. Uh, some countries say if we don't put climate change as a goal in the, uh, in the SDGs, we will not get the attention to climate change that we need. And we actually already have a goal. Do you know what goal that is on climate change, agreed, in the Climate Change Convention? What is the goal that is agreed? To stay under two degree increase. Right? And we are, we are not on a good uh, traje trajectory uh, for that. So that is an unresolved uh, issue. Uh, some things can be put in as cross-cutting. Cross you know, you will have a structure of goals. You have a goal, then you have targets, a certain number of targets under the goal, and then you have a certain number of indicators that you will use to measure progress. And of course, by having good indicators, you can actually get a good, very good um, system that you can monitor if you have the data uh, to do it. So the indicators are very important, the targets are also very important, but of course there's a, a lot of signal value in the goal, uh, like with the, um, we've seen with the MDGs. Now, there's also a discussion around what universality uh, means. Developed countries, are of the opinion that universality means that all countries have responsibilities. And developed countries do not want to be held accountable without having the resources to achieve, right? So we are back into a very classic discussion about the means of implementation. How will developing countries um, get the funding uh, for that? And I'll speak to that in a, in a little while when we speak about uh, official development assistance. CBDR, does anyone know what that is? It means common but differentiated responsibilities. This was a principle agreed in Rio in 1992. Uh, it refers to some countries being wealthier, having more responsibility for how the world is developing by their actions and others having less responsibility. I think a very clear uh, example here is climate change, where the African continent emits 
I don't recall exact, but it's so little of the world's CO2, but they will bear a lot of the uh, impacts from climate change uh, in terms of uh, drought and uh, uh, changing, a changing environment that will make it very difficult to grow the normal crops, for instance. For instance, corn will be, they will not be able to cultivate corn in, uh, I think it's 40% of, of the African country, continent when we get uh, to higher temperatures. So there we have an example of something happening which is certainly not um, Africa's uh, fault. What makes it tricky in this context is that developed countries say the meaning of CPRD is the meaning of Rio in 92 it relates to climate change, global environmental issues, and that's it. The G77 developing countries, on the other hand, say no, this relates to the entire new agenda. Every issue has a, a common but differentiated responsibility. Uh, so we already see that the, the negotiations which have not really started are starting by uh, this positioning. And uh, also with the last point, means of implementation, which is going to be a very critical issue in the discussion. Uh, the G77 says we want every goal to have its own means of implementation. You indicate in every goal what the means of implementation uh, will be. And of course they, they do that because the the 0.7 of development assistance was never, uh, never materialized. Only a few countries have lived up to, to this, and the MDGs did not have uh, means of implementation uh, attached. But uh, we already see how the discussion is shaping up uh, around um, these issues, and we also see how the division between with the environmental issues and the social issues also go into a, a, a divide by um, uh, some being uh, singled out for a certain um, discussion. The Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals is part of a, a wider process. We have many processes uh, ongoing that will all somehow play into, this, uh, into the shaping of this new development uh, agenda. Uh, we have a particular process also coming out of Rio on sustainable development finance, it's still ongoing. We have a new financing for development conference coming up, also very much related. We have a discussion in the General Assembly on technology facilitation, which is a key issue for developing countries. Uh, they say rich countries own all the, the technology and for them to prosper they need to have access. Of course that is a tricky issue because it's mostly owned by private companies. So it's not just something you can transfer. Um, we have a high level political forum. This was a new body that came out of, um, of Rio in 2012. Uh, it, it is a hybrid between the General Assembly and the um, what's called ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council, depending on the level uh, it meets. Every four years it will meet at the level of heads of state and, and government and in between minister, ministerial level. This body is likely to have some kind of monitoring, reporting, reviewing role with the SDGs. That is being discussed now. So there will be some mechanism. I don't know if you know, but there are other international mechanisms where you have um, regular reviews of how countries are doing, the Human Rights Council for instance, under the Human Rights Conventions you have regular reviews and so on. There's always been a lot of resistance uh, towards having, again, having that kind of, of review when you talk about um, environmental issues, anything that get anywhere near that. Uh, so it's not likely that there will be a review mechanism of that kind where governments are obliged to report but probably some uh, volunteer, vol volunteering uh, mechanism uh, and then slowly um, the confidence will build and more and more governments will uh, volunteer to be, uh, to be reviewed. Um, but the modalities are not at all clear yet. Then the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon will present his synthesis report uh, at the end of the year and uh, he will bring, try to bring everything together to sort of put out 
a report for governments and say, here it is, and the negotiations, no, negotiations will be uh, ongoing already or they will be about um, uh, to start. I already, already mentioned the climate change COP21 COP, uh, in 2015. We, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see where that is going. And the final one, you can, maybe you don't see it very well, is the outcome of the high-level meeting on the global partnership in Mexico, which may also be included, although it's not a UN uh, process. This was the follow-up meeting to the meeting in Busan in 2011 I was talking uh, about. And uh, I'll just turn to that now, because the third part and last part of the presentation is on implementation or the how, how will it be done, right? I think the first part was what, uh, the second is, was a lot about process, but also about what, uh, and then there is the whole issue, how will, it, once we have an, an agenda, how will it be um, implemented? Now, we have the unfinished business of official development uh, assistance. You know, there's a goal from the adopted uh, in the General Assembly in the 70s that all got, um, developed countries should give 0.7% of their uh, gross national income as um, ODA and you will see there's a green line going down, you'll see very few countries actually uh, live up uh, to that even though many years have, um, have passed and of course this is a very thorny issue for uh, developing countries although the world has changed a lot since that goal was uh, was adopted. Of course, we have a world now where um, the developing countries is a very, very wide and homogeneous um, uh, concept. Um, some have become high-income countries, they've become middle-income countries. It's a different story than uh, the story of the 70s. Still, this issue is uh, very important. Now, in, uh, 2013, in 2013, development assistance actually reached its highest level ever. OECD DAC is the one pulling these numbers uh, together and it rose by 6.1% in 2013. Uh, but it still doesn't um, go above the 0.26% uh, of the global GNI. So in that um, sense, nothing is, is really moving. And there were also concerns expressed when these numbers came out because, and one of them was Helen Clark, the, the administrator of uh, UNDP, uh, who said that there are certain expenses that governments um, use ODA to pay for that are maybe not really uh, worthy of ODA financing. So uh, there is an issue there. Uh, I just want to show you the multilateral share or the bilateral share of um, of this uh, ODA, uh, you will see the blue, the blue purple at the bottom is the bilateral, which is uh, growing. The multilateral, which is the one, the whole UN system, the uh, World Bank, multilateral development banks, and so on, are financed uh, by, is uh, more or less uh, stable. Um, so uh, the, we are, we don't have a growing, uh, we don't have a growing budget or role. Uh, but uh, we are staying more or less uh, at, uh, at the, the level. The questions, of course, is uh, what role development cooperation will play in uh, the post-2015 um, development agenda. I already mentioned that uh, countries are graduating, they're becoming middle-income countries or high-income countries. And you may know that um, this is a classification coming from the World Bank. And when countries pass these thresholds uh, by um, uh, gross national income per capita, they graduate from the system and there are certain kinds of ODA assistance that they are no longer entitled to, to receive. So in theory, with more countries graduating, there would be, and we see that the overall budget is increasing, in theory, there would be more money for the poorest countries, right? That's quite logical. But that's not the case. Actually, in 2013, the share of the least in, uh, low-income countries or the least developed countries, notably in Africa, 
went down. So they are getting less. More money is going to middle income countries, maybe because uh, donors also see a relation with trade. The, as again, the, the whole thinking around all this is changing and s some donor countries have actually merged their development cooperation with their trade uh, in foreign ministries. So the landscape is, is altering um, in many ways. Now there are questions where and how can ODA have the greatest impact in leveraging other sources of development financing. I, refer I mentioned the, the tax issues uh, earlier and one of the things that is being discussed now more than ever is how ODA can be used to leverage and be a catalytic, catalytic force in building countries' own tax systems and building an international system that can uh, maybe make sure, I don't know, you know, in the G20 have agreed that there will be exchange of tax information and so on. So ODA can play a very important role um, in that regard. In addition to, of course, in the poorest countries going directly to the financing of health or um, other uh, health costs or, or other uh, needs. Um, then, who are the donors of today and do they play by the same rules? Uh, now, I think Korea was the last country, or there may be one more, to join OECD DAC in uh, 2009. But we have more donors out there because these countries who are becoming um, richer and they want to work with other countries, they want to share. So many, many countries actually uh, have development cooperation now. UNDP is working with many of them to help them set up uh, their domestic systems. Of course, also because we would like them to see, to abide by certain rules and norms because otherwise it's there's no way we can um, uh, we can know whether it's actually uh, development uh, assistance. But um, some of these countries may join OECD uh, and there are countries who have applied. There are more and more countries joining OECD but they may not join OECD DAC because that is seen as the, the rich a little bit as the rich uh, club. At least some are, uh, are withholding um, on that. So um, they don't probably today play by the same rules, but the discussions are ongoing and not least in the context of the global partnership on effect oh, I, development cooperation effectiveness, which I have spoken about a few times um, before. Um, one of the, the discussions there, and you will see that from this um, agenda from the Mexico meeting in April. These are the five headlines of the meeting and of the communique. And you will see the issues that I've been discussing today repeated there. Progress since Busan, which is progress on the principles. These principles came out of a meeting in OCD in Paris in 2005, and they're all about country ownership, the, the country being in the drive, the recipient country being in the driver's seat of what happens, not donors putting aid in, but the government taking charge. Donors using country systems to deliver because we want to build capacity. Um, we don't want to build parallel structures that duplicate and which don't leave anything behind once the money is gone um, or is spent. So this whole agenda makes very, very good sense to, to get more out of development assistance and to help build capacity in uh, the countries that, that need it. So one item of course is has progress been made? It's not that, uh, there isn't that much uh, progress because donors do find it difficult to use country systems and uh, that's of course taxpayer money, money going into maybe budget, um, um, budget allocations and, and no accounting and so on. So there are many issues and discussion around that, but it's important to keep following that, um, that agenda. Then the second item was the partnering for effective taxation and domestic resource mobilization. I've touched upon this several times. The third is South, South Triangular uh, Cooperation and Knowledge Sharing, and that relates to all the new donors and the new relationships. And this is a very... Uh, 
It's an issue that keeps coming up in many meetings and many discussions in many, country, uh, in many uh, contexts. Uh, in a few weeks, UNDP and Turkey will be co-hosting uh, a conference in Istanbul that zooms in on exactly this um, issue. Then there's the question of development cooperation with the middle-income countries. How is that different from working with the, with the low-income countries? And the final issue is business, a business as a partner in development. Public-private partnerships, you've heard about all, this, uh, this, all these agendas. How do business become responsible partners in, um, in development? In addition, there were 37 voluntary uh, initiatives um, launched by governments in Mexico. And uh, two of, uh, one of these initiatives was a, um, launched by Korea. Uh, it's a training, helping to train uh, governments working on the Busan principles and on the um, implementation. And this training will take place in Korea in autumn, back to back with uh, an implementation meeting that was um, mentioned in the outcome document uh, and welcomed with appreciation, which is Korea hosting uh, an annual meeting, an annual workshop where we take stock of where implementation progress since Busan is. Where are we, we in terms of implementation? And uh, my center, the UNDP Seoul Policy Center, uh, is, uh, will be working with the Korean government uh, on the preparation of, of these, um, uh, of these uh, meetings. Now, almost my final slide. This is a quote from the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, again, the Busan, Mexico. Uh, where the countries who were present in Mexico, and this is not all countries, expressed the wish to see the global partnership become part of the how of the implementation of the post-2015 agenda. But since some 30 countries are missing from the Busan-Mexico discussions, and the post-2015, of course, is a general assembly, with 193 countries, we still don't know how this will, um, will shape up. But, but of course, uh, a lot of work has been done under the Global Partnership and um, it will, they will continue uh, with the meetings I, I just spoke about, uh, in, hosted in Korea, um, within the next half a year. And before then, uh, before autumn, we will of course have the report of the Open Working Group on, on Sustainable Development. Um, goals. That will be very interesting to see. There will be more discussions on the role for the high-level political forum on the monitoring, reporting, reviewing of that new agenda. Uh, and it will be decided when the actual negotiations, when governments will go into real negotiation mode, right? This month in the Open Working Group, later this month, there will be some negotiations starting on targets but it's not the full-fledged, right? We're still, and, and there's been a, a, an attempt to hold a bit back uh, on this, not go into the negotiation mode too early because then it will come, it will keep on, go on, go on. Usually we say that governments take as much time as they have to uh, arrive at a, at a result. Now, in 2015, everything will have to come together and hopefully in uh, a very ambitious post-2015 development agenda with a set of SDGs, targets, indicators, uh, a plan for reviewing progress, a narrative, um, and so on. And internally in the UN system, we are also discussing how we can adapt to this new agenda by becoming more fit for purpose, and that is actually also about better integration, uh, delivering as one at the country level, which is a voluntary way of, for the UN to work together in countries. but. 36 countries have now asked us to work with one leader, one plan, one budget, one program, uh, and become one organization at the country level, even though we are many uh, organizations that have been set up in, uh, in different contexts. To conclude, to conclude <coughs> uh, this is not an easy uh, journey to get to arrive at this post-2015 development agenda. I think it's one that concerns all of us. It's really important for everyone in this room, for everyone out there. Um, 
but the journey to get there and also the journey to implement it is going to be very long. It took years before the MDGs had actually been, there was an uptake and, and an understanding of them. Maybe it will be easier this time, but still it will take, um, it will take a while. Uh, the final remark is, uh, my final remark is an African um, proverb that says, if you want to travel fast, travel alone. And if you want to travel far, travel together. Thank you. <laughs>